Spirit is upon us, and I pray that we are filled with the Holy Spirit going forward um, as conquerors uh, through the work of Jesus Christ that we rely on. And as we begin our new year, we're going to uh, spend a couple of weeks um, just going through uh, a theme called Do Not Lose Heart. Uh, so we would like to begin with placing our hearts in the right place, uh, not only for our own lives personally, but for the people around us. How does God desire us to live? And I pray that this new year, may the Lord continue to shine upon us and may we continue to walk faithfully with Him, uh, despite how difficult it may be, uh, regardless uh, if you are walking closely with the Lord. I trust that it will be a joy, joyous year for all of us this year, and that we will be going through the Word of God with the theme of not losing heart, and I pray that uh, we would not do that, certainly, because it feels like the more and more the numbers that represent my age gets larger and larger each year, I feel like it is easier. It's getting easier to lose heart. I don't know why. Maybe it's just the weakness of, of my flesh. Um, but exterior elements like people saying things uh, or it could be unfortunate events or accidents that may happen uh, that may cause us to lose hope and lose heart. And sometimes it would be devastating where we may never uh, recover. But especially as Christians, uh, we are now living in an age where Christianity, uh, as Christians, we will have to make a choice uh, to not lose heart and stand with God or to be swept away uh, by this depraved generation. So I pray uh, whatever the Lord has in store for us in the new year, I pray that we would guard our hearts and I pray that we would Continue each day uh, holding on to Him, not losing heart, but offering all of our hearts uh, to the Lord as His people. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, I'll be reading to you verses 7 through 12 uh, from the ESV. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying the body, the death of, Christ, of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's ask God's blessing one more time as we go in uh, to the Holy Scriptures. Father, O oh God, I pray that you truly do the wonders of moving our hearts to a place where it needs to be and opening up not just our ears but our lives to the Holy Scriptures. And I pray, oh God, that it will be you that speak uh, through us, uh, to us through your Holy Word. And I pray that we would be changed as a result of our listening but also of our believing and also of our following. So Father, we lift up this hour into your hands, in Christ's name we pray, amen. <clears throat> so this passage, I don't know if you have noticed, uh, inside the bulletin, there's a little section for memory verses. Starting January of 2022, I have begun uh, this passage as our memory scripture. So beginning with verse 7, ending in verse 18. Each verse was our month's uh, memory verse. And I was hoping that at the end of the year, as we have memorized these scriptures, uh, that we would con conclude the year uh, by uh, hearing from this passage. And here we are in the new year, and we have made this full cycle. And I pray that this passage really takes root in our hearts as we begin our new year. So if there's an image that describes United States as a country, 
What image comes to your mind? I would probably imagine an iconic U.S. bald eagle. Okay, uh, bald eagle. Uh, there's nothing wrong with bald, being bald, uh, but it's the eagle that symbolizes America, right? The eagle, a great eagle with its head that is white. Uh, it symbolizes its beauty, the strength, but also when you look at it, it's majestic in such awesome ways. The average adult wingspan of the bald eagle is about 6 to 7.5 feet, so it is a humongous bird. And it definitely has an element of awe. You know, when you see it soar, when you see it hunt, uh, it is just uh, a picture, a great picture of finesse, grace, but also of power. So I think for that, I think an image that describes U.S. Uh, is rifle, and it's fitting uh, for that bald eagle to be the icon. But if there's an image that accurately describes the gospel, in all of its complexity, I believe Paul's imagery in today's text of the treasure in a jar clay, or clay jar, encapsulates the essence of the gospel quite well. But the image is readily uncomfortable as you kind of picture it, right? It is almost even upsetting when you think about the picture, a jar that is made up of clay, that is holding a very, very valuable treasure. Why is that image so uncomfortable and upsetting? It is probably because no one brings out treasure in a jar made of clay, right? No one serves treasure. No one carries around a, a highly valuable treasure in a jar of clay. Why is that? It's because for several reasons. One, the intrinsic value is certainly lopsided, right? The value of the treasure versus the value of the vessel that is holding, it is nowhere near. It is not matching. It is not complementary to the beauty or to the value of the treasure. And certainly the beauty of it is quite opposite as well. Right? The treasure is beautiful, absolutely awesome, breathtaking in its view. But a jar of clay is very clashing in its presentation of its beauty. But not only that, uh, it is very rugged and it is undesirable as a vessel. But also, uh, the hardness is very different as well. The hardness of that treasure. When I think of treasure, I immediately think of the one most valuable gem, and that is the diamonds, right? It is hard, and it is uh, very, very hard in its comp composition, but a jar that is made of clay is quite fragile, even brittle uh, in its composition. So we need to find out what this treasure represents that Paul used in this weird combination of a treasure that is held by an earthly vessel. Why is it? Why is Paul using these two to describe the very essence of Christianity and the gospel message, message that he is preaching with his life? Well, the meaning of the treasure is found in the previous verses, the earlier verses of chapter 4. If you read, it goes on something like this. Paul is describing his ministry and he is encouraging the church, telling them not to lose heart because he is not losing heart in his ministry. It says in verse 1, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statements of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So what is he saying? He is saying that we have this message, we have this practice of ministry that we want to be pure, that we do not want to follow any cunning or any ulterior motives, but we want to be definitely be pure in our motives and in our conscience before everyone in our practices. And for that, he is saying we're not losing heart despite of the opposition that he is facing verse 3 it says and even if our gospel is veiled 
It is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So what he is saying is the message is Jesus Christ as our Lord. That is his message. And he is saying, ourselves, uh, we are offering to you as the servants so that we serve you for the sake of Jesus Christ and his message. So the gospel is Jesus Christ being Lord, and they're willing to become servants to one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, who is their Lord. And that is the image that he is going forward with his preaching ministry. And then verse 6. So this is what we're looking for. Verse 6 carries uh, the, the biggest clue as to what the treasure is and what the jar of clay is also. It says in verse 6, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what is he saying? He is saying, God has shown in our hearts to give the light. And what is that light? The knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So he is describing the treasure as the light that God has given us. And what is that light? It is the glory of God that is revealed in the person, in the face of Jesus Christ. So it is really... Uh, encapsulating the core and the heart of his gospel message into an image of a beautiful treasure that gives light to our hearts. So the treasure is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And this is the light. And how is he describing this light? This light is given to us by the one who has spoken light into darkness. So he's going back all the way to Genesis. He's saying, from the very beginning, the one who has given light into the darkness is the same one who is giving the light into our darkened hearts. And if you know the story of Paul, in his conversion, as he has encountered Jesus Christ in his person, he became blinded. Right? So he has also experienced his, being, his blindness being lifted up through the light of Jesus Christ. So with all that said, he is saying, this is my message. This is my gospel. This is my ministry. It is a treasure that God has given us, the light that he has given through Jesus Christ to all of our darkened hearts. This is the gospel, the fullness of God, the most radiant Consider that treasure, the one that is most radiant, the one that is most beautiful, the one that is most perfect, the strongest in its nature, unbreakable in nature. This is the fullness of God encapsulated in the face of Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ, dwelling in the most humble form. So before we take this image treasure in a jar of clay before we apply it into our lives we can consider this image in the person of jesus christ dwelling in the most humble form isaiah 53 verses 2 and 3 it says this describing of our savior jesus christ the messiah it says for he which is the messiah jesus christ for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces as he was despised, and we esteemed him not. So the, the perfect fullness of God Right, The unbreakable nature, the perfect beauty, 
the perfect radiance, the, the glorious image of God has come down in a form of a humble vessel, in a body of a man. But not just that. Just as that jar of clay was undesirable in its nature, how it's rugged, how it's uh, brittle, how it's not shiny, how it's not strong, Jesus took on that form. He was rejected, despised. No one desired him because there was absolutely no beauty found in our Savior, Jesus Christ. He became the jar of clay to make himself how? To become available for us. To bring that glorious radiance into our lives, making himself absolutely, absolutely approachable to each and every one of us. And that passage says he is rejected, not only that, but he was man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. So he really lowered himself all the way down to a, a state where we grieve over our sinful nature. We grieve over the pains in life. And he found himself sharing in that grief so that we can be approaching the Lord through this very, very approachable path unto God, namely the person of Jesus Christ. He became a man, uh, he became a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And this is how Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, describes this process of God being fullness in his glory, coming down in a jar of clay, bringing that glory in upon himself in a bodily form. Hebrews chapter 2 and chapter, two, chapter 4 describes his humiliation, his humility in this way. It says, chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every aspect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself suffered when tempted, he is now able to help those who are being tempted. Can you make that connection? His humility, the theological term is the humiliation of God, humbleness of God coming in to our world as a human being to do what? to open up ways for a sinful and broken and hurting people to relate to him and to be helped when we are tempted, when we are hurting, when we are broken. Hebrews 4. Let's read Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16 together. Ready, set, go. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What a beautiful passage. The God that we worship, he is not just a treasure of heaven. He is not just a glorious gem to be worshipped in heaven, but he made himself available to us. He came down in a form that is very, very humble, that is very, very vulnerable, so that he could sympathize. But I love how the Bible is rendered. He, it says, the high priest who is, uh, who is not unable to sympathize, right? It says we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. This double negation adds the emphasis to his ability to sympathize with every turn and every downhill and every sharp pain that we go through as human beings. And God is able to sympathize in every weakness of our lives. Why? Because God himself has become that jar of clay for us so that we could find grace in time of need. He himself has made absolutely available and approachable for the sinners to come and find life 
in him. It's already been almost three years when I worked for a secular company. Uh, it was a company that we uh, provided parts for an automotive industry. And that company gave me a nice laptop. And in that laptop had a Skype business messenger app that was uh, already installed. Uh, that every time you open up your computer, that already logs you in. Right? So it's almost like, oh, hey, I got a nice laptop. But they'll know exactly what you're doing. And they'll know if you're um, just uh, slacking and whatnot. But in that messenger, uh, Skype business, uh, you can select your status, right? Uh, if you select green, it means you're available. If you select red, it means you're busy. A yellow clock would mean that you're away. And a red bar going across means do not disturb. And just an empty circle means you're offline. But there was something special about that green button where it says available. Right? There's something very positive about that status that makes yourself readily available for others to reach out to you when they needed some questions answered, when they needed some uh, tips, or when they needed to kind of find you if you have done something wrong. It allows that communication to be open when your status is green lit with the message available. It is such a positive status. And Jesus did not make himself busy with the red light. Or he wasn't away with the yellow clock. He didn't say, do not desert, disturb because I'm doing something more important than you. He certainly did not stay offline, disconnected with the world that he has created. He spun it and then he kind of stepped back and said, ah, oh, let me see how you guys do well. But he made himself readily available for each and every one of us to connect directly to God through the work of Jesus Christ. Our pathway has been lit green so that we can find grace and help in time of need. This is the God that we serve. He made himself available for us, became very approachable. This past couple of days, uh, I took a group of us to Students for Christ conference. And the keynote, spoke, uh, keynote speaker spoke a bit on Jesus' incarnation. When God created Adam, God created him in an adult state to begin with, right? He didn't create him as an infant baby, but when God created the first Adam, he created in an adult state. But when sin entered, entered the world, God himself came down as a second Adam, but this time he didn't come in as an adult state. He made himself even lower. He made himself even more vulnerable. He made himself even more available and more approachable as he came in a form of an infant, helpless baby. What does that mean? He couldn't survive if Mary wasn't around. He wouldn't survive if Joseph didn't provide for Jesus. He made himself absolutely, absolutely vulnerable so that, we could, so that he could sympathize with our weaknesses. This is the humiliation of God. Humble himself all the way down so that we could approach him. He made himself in a very, very fragile jar of clay. But not just Jesus made himself approachable in his incarnation. Jesus made himself brittle to save those that he came to save. He became fragile to save those who came to him because he was approachable in his humility. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Paul speaks of the humiliation, the availability of Christ, and look at the work that God accomplishes through his humiliation and through his approachability. Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Let's read together in one voice. 
Ready, set, go. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, uh, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So Paul, once again, he is speaking of the fullness of God, but dwelling where? In a jar of clay. In a jar of clay. In a body of Jesus Christ. But what did that accomplish? Not just making God being available for all of us, but he has reconciled. All that was broken. He has reconciled all that has been, been fallen because of sin, including all of creation, heaven and on earth. He has now made a way. He has connected that broken relationship once again. Through what, though? Through making peace by the blood of his cross. So he not only became brittle, he shattered himself. He broke himself. He threw himself on the ground, and that jar of clay is broken into a million pieces so that we could all get a piece of Jesus Christ as the bread of life. That is the work that he has accomplished. And Jesus welcomed all, all those who came to him and broke himself up on the cross so that we may be reconciled. And then continuing on with that Isaiah passage, Isaiah 53, the passage that begins by saying how undesirable our, our Christ was. This is what it says, continuing on from verse 4 through 7. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Like a sheep that... Uh, before his shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He took upon all that breaking, all that shattering, all that tearing up of his body so that we may be healed because of his affliction, because of his oppression. Let that sink in a little bit. The, the Christmas that we have just celebrated, that's what it all meant. That Jesus has come to make himself available for us so that we could be sons and daughters of God. So since Jesus is our treasure, if that Jesus is our treasure, right? The fullness of God in the face of our Savior Jesus Christ. What does that mean for all of us? In the new year, I believe that we can become like the jars of clay so that we become approachable to others like Jesus as well. So that we allow others to see the life-giving treasure that we hold in our hearts. If we have talked about the union between God and Jesus God's glory being the treasure, and that treasure coming in the form of a humble, a humble baby Jesus in a jar of clay. Paul was certainly talking about this image as God's willing heart to work with us humans in the union between now God and us, God and man as well. How do we know? Going back to our today's text, verse 6, it says, For God has shown that light in our hearts. 
to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying that glorious light in the treasure, he has given that light into your hearts. So what does our bodies now become? We become the jars of clay. And that message of God's glory being in the Son, Jesus Christ, becomes our treasure. And sadly, it is so true. We are like jars of clay. We are ever brittle and ever fragile than anything. I mentioned earlier, right, the longer the time passes, it feels like it is even, it gets easier and easier for, for us to become brittle and for us to break and for us to crack. And I began to wonder for a long time now, why did God call me to carry on the work of his ministry? Lord, why are you calling me? Because you are so worthy, but I am so unworthy. You are an absolutely perfectly holy God, but why are you using me, an unholy vessel, to do your work, to carry and to spread your gospel? God, you are an absolutely perfectly good God, but Lord, I have more bad moments than good. How can you choose to give that treasure into this earthly vessel that I am so unable, that I am so incapable of doing any good to your kingdom and to your service? I lose heart always thinking about that. I crack every time when I am tempted. When trials come, I crack, I break, I shatter. And I'm sure you share the similar pains. Why did God give that valuable, absolutely beautiful treasure to be wasted away in jars of clays like you and I? Have you thought about that? Well, that purpose is given in our text this morning. Let's read first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. That verse tells us why God chose to do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Let's read together in one voice. Ready, set, go. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God. And not to us. Amen. That's the reason he has given that unbreakable, the one most beautiful, perfect treasure in our brittle and fragile, filled with cracks kind of jars of clay. Because he wants us to know that this surpassing power is not in the clay but it is in the unbreakable treasure. It's never been about you being stronger for the Lord. It's never been about you becoming smarter, knowing more for the Lord. And we constantly, as Christians, we fall into, the, into this trap thinking that we have to be stronger for God. We have to be smarter for God We want to look more capable. Even as pastors, that is one thing that I struggle with the most. Because I feel constantly that I am an in, incapable, unable, incapable pastor. Because my vessel is just as earthen as all of us. But let this verse serve as reminders for all of us. That the surpassing power is not in us, but it is in God who is with us. Amen? And that is the reason why God wants us to remember that all He wants from us is to be like that clay that is crumbling away so that the treasure that is in us will be more visible to others. God doesn't want us to be shiny. God doesn't want us to be flashy. He doesn't want us to be strong. He doesn't want even us to be beautiful, spiritually speaking. 
Why? So that the beauty of the treasure could be displayed through our lives. If we constantly strive to be stronger and to be smarter and to be better, guess what? We're just adding more things to cover up the treasure that God has given us, the fullness of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, and that saving good news that he wants us to bring that to the people around us. But if all of our Christian walk is about us just being better and smarter than other people and, and being, becoming stronger than the other, the person next to us, we will never display the beauty of the treasure that God has given us. The treasure is not displayed. The strength and the hardness of the diamond it will not be proven. The radiance will not be magnified. It's the same concept. At weddings in Korea, I, I don't know, we just had a wedding uh, had been in Korea, but there's this unspoken rule uh, in Korea. I'm not sure if it's true here in the States as well, but the ladies do not attend weddings wearing white. Right? That's like an unspoken rule, right? No ladies are to wear white dress or white outfits to a wedding. Why? Because that white dress or that white outfit is reserved for the bride. Right? You don't want to just bring any kind, any sense of any competition or any uh, comparable image. Because that day, at least for that day or that, for that one hour window, whatever it is, it would be all about that bride. Shining bright in that glorious and beautiful white dress. Or if you go shopping for jewels, especially diamonds... If you go up in the stores, the clerks will show you the jewels where? Are they going to just show the diamonds on that glass uh, table? No, they will bring out what? A black velvet board. And on top of that, they will place whatever jewel that you're looking for, especially if it's a diamond. Why is that? They want all the backgrounds to be blackened, to be simplified, to be uniformed, so that the beauty of the jewels will be exemplarate, uh, uh, exaggerated, magnified. That is our role. And I pray that magnified together, that we magnify the Lord by us becoming like earthen vessels, striving to be brittle so that we just fade away. All of our pride is stripped away so that the beauty of God and the glory of God in the fullness displayed in Jesus Christ would be magnified in our hearts. And guess what happens when we do that? Let's read verses 8 and on, and then we'll conclude our message uh, with this thought. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. Let's read together in one voice. Ready, set, go. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Look at that last phrase. The death is, work, is at work in me, but what does that mean? It means life for you. Can we take pride in being a jar of clay? rather than striving to be a better vessel, bigger vessel, stronger vessel, more beautiful vessel unto the He's not looking for any of that. He's looking for a clean vessel that is willing to fade away like that velvet board to display the beauty of the, the treasure that God has given us. And that makes us indestructibly fragile. That oxymoron. We are fragile, but because of the treasure that is in us, we are persecuted, but we will never be crushed. 
Our bodies are dying away, but we will always live with the fullness of life that is provided in the person of Jesus Christ. And may we, going forward in the year 2023, may we live like jars of clay. And may we find all of our strength in the treasure that God has given us. And may we never lose heart going forward for the glory of God. With that thought in mind, let's come to the Lord in prayer. As the praise team comes forward, let's think about where we are in terms of our walk with the Lord. Have we been wrestling, trying to become stronger for the Lord or better for the Lord? What God is asking of us is to be like Him in His absolute humility, in His absolute availability, approachability, coming into the world in the form of a humble, helpless baby so that life could be given.